Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. Now, this is the podcast on 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, and 2 Samuel 6, uh, 1 through 5, and then Psalm 150. And this is all about David as God's anointed, making a covenant with the people. So we've had this theme of covenant. And so in chapter 5 uh, of 2 Samuel, it says, um, so all the is- elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So notice something weird's going on. On the one hand, it says he's already king. They make that point. They, It's one of the few places I know where they say King David made a covenant with them, that David already has some of the tribes who, uh, who are loyal to him and acknowledge him as king, but now the rest of the tribes. And then he's going to do something in this lesson uh, about unifying the people, uh, connecting it back. So we we exit the time of the judges, as Catherine said in the podcast last week. Uh, it goes from the time of the judges, the idea was God is directly king over the people. And then uh, so we have a king, it's God, but th- that proved to be both chaotic, anarchic, uh, anarchy, uh, and uh, it proved to be inefficient. And so multiple pressures, but mostly pressures from within. And the time of judges ends in absolute chaos, as uh, Catherine said last week, with uh, one of the most horrible stories in the Bible, uh, which is a, a story of gang rape and then civil war. So it says there was no king at that time, and everyone did what they that everyone did whatever they wanted, essentially. So David, so then God says, okay, I'm going to give in and let you have a human king in order to really establish order, but to continue to worship me, uh, which brings us uh, to this story. I love about this story, really um, two things. I mean, you might see what's going on here. Um, there was, I'm sorry, there was a king in between Saul, but that didn't work out uh, particularly well. But that's another sermon for another time. And so David is made king. And so then what does David do? David um, moves the capital to a new city, Jerusalem, that had not been part of Israel. And David p- puts God at the center of the people. He does that by bringing up the Ark of the Covenant, you know, what, where they had the Ten Commandments and the cherubim, it had been left in dry storage at some place uh, p- called uh, Baal Judah. And um, so this is, I mean, this is really a powerful thing to ask a congregation. What does it mean if we are to set God at the center of this group of people? What does it mean as a church? I think that's a, you know, powerful message. Um but there's this great story. It's not exactly part of the uh, really? story. Oh, it happens afterwards. But in the act of, uh, so this thing has been in storage. So then they bring it out up and uh, somebody touches it and gets killed, right? That's a weird, uh, it, you know, it zaps him, I think, <laughs> Catherine. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so David says, uh-oh, and then he puts it in dry st- in another place because now he's afraid of it. And that farm starts to prosper. So David says, okay, good. We have to bring it, but don't touch it. So the idea is that it is a powerful thing, but like Aslan, the the lion, uh, the Christ figure in C.S. Lewis's stories, um, is he a tame lion? No, but he's good. Good. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting uh, story. Uh, And I've, I always tell my students when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant to think about it as, and the tabernacle where it's housed, think of it as a power plant, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's not uh, not malevolent, right? But you better darn sure be ready and prepare yourself to approach that power plant and be, you know, have the right equipment and the right attitude and be alert and all of that, or you're going to get zapped to use that technical term, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very technical. Uh, so, yeah, so that's that's how I uh, talk about the the Ark of the Covenant. But uh, I like I like where you were going with that, uh, uh, Rolf. The 
the um, establishing the new capital at Jerusalem and then putting God at the center. I think that's that's a really nice way of putting it uh, and something that we could emulate. I, I just want to uh, acknowledge here that David is a complicated figure. Right? <laughs> like uh, immediately before uh, he's crowned king over all the tribes, uh, Ishbaal, who is uh, Saul's son, who was made uh, kind of uh, made the the kind of rival king uh, over the tribes that weren't loyal to David. Uh, Ishbaal is assassinated, right? And David is innocent of it and, and kind of maybe protest too much that he's innocent of it, right? But somehow all of David's enemies or potential rivals get killed, uh, including Abner, Saul's old general. So uh, so yeah, David David's a complicated uh, figure. And this is even, you know, this is even before the 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 um, story about Bathsheba. Uh, he's not uh, he he's come in for a lot of criticism in scholarship uh, and in popular culture, even in the last, uh, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Uh, one scholar calls him, you know, king, murderer. Uh, uh, I forget the, the terminology he uses, but it's not, it's not complimentary. But I just want to say this. I just want to, I just want to say a word in defense of David. And, and a lot of it is around this, um, the story of him bringing the ark into Jerusalem, right? He's, he, Whatever else you say about him, he he has a zealous, uh, he has a he heart after he has God. a heart for the Lord, right? He is passionately uh, committed to the God of Israel, uh, it's so much so that he's willing to make a fool of himself by dancing nearly naked before the ark as the ark is brought into Jerusalem, and his his wife Michal, you know, uh, uh, is embarrassed by him. And he says, "I'll make myself even more embarrassing, right? <laughs> because this is this is reason to be joyful." Uh, and so there's, you know, whatever else you say about David, he has a certain uh, zeal for the Lord that is that is admirable, in my opinion. I appreciate that. Um, we um, we we did this big jump. We ended Ruth with uh, the naming uh, King David. You know, so we've got uh, right. uh, the son Obit, who's son is Jesse and Jesse is the father of David who would become king. And, um, and then, then we actually have this story of uh, the, this, this prophet Samuel. And as he's old and his people, his children have turned out to be horrible rulers, not kings, but rulers. And then there's this request uh, that Ralph, you said God, uh, you know, uh, 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 acquiesces to. This is a request of Israel. We want a king like everybody else. It's First Samuel chapter eight. And the interesting thing is through Judges and um, this time of Judges, where we read the story of Ruth, and through Samuel coming up to first the naming of Saul is. Basically, Israel refuses to follow the covenant. Israel refuses to live as if God is their God. And the language that you used as we began, Rolf, is to live as if God is king. And then uh, in, in you know, 1 Samuel, when they ask for a king, uh, God and Samuel have this conversation where, where God says, you know, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Let's tell them what their king is going to be like. And David is just like that kind of king, as is Saul. You know, Saul turns out to be exactly what um, God warned Israel that the kings would be like. And the truth is, as we continue to read through this, we're going to find the kings are all like God warned they would be. And David is no different. But Catherine, I'm like you. I always want to pause and say, but David has that zeal for the Lord. And what makes David different uh, and a couple of other kings, not many, uh, but a couple of the other kings, what makes them different is the fact that they are trying to serve God. And the word for us, I think, Stop trying to be perfect on your own strength because we can't. But try to keep God at the center. 
and watch how God brings an increase and abundance in life. Heck, I think I that's what Ralph described. Yeah, I got a question for you, Joy. Mm-hmm. So um, you've got, I think with the idea, and by the way, I, st- my, I stole this from my brother, Carl, I better say that, the idea that David is putting God at the center of the people and by bringing the, the ark in. And then here's you, the way you do it, uh, this, I'm throwing it to you in a minute, uh, Joy, is with dancing and songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And that's why we've got Psalm 150 also paired here. Yeah. And so what we wind up with is if, uh, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can make my own metaphor. Um, I think this year I can say Taylor Swift is coming to town. <laughs> and, I did not expect. I, I did not expect <laughs> that. All right, and let's so, go. Bring it on. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I did a lot of traveling this last summer, and I seemed to be in the cities right before or right after she was there, and everybody was all excited. And if it was right before, um, people were talking. I, I was with this one, this one event. I won't, won't name it, but I was at this one event. And um, the uh, singer that was leading the event after after their performance said, um, I got Taylor Swift tickets. And yeah. they broke out into dance. And I'm like, yeah. okay, you just let us in worship. You were like the key singer. And now you're dancing and singing because you got Taylor Swift song, uh, tickets. And that's the, that's the segue, Rolf. If you're going to truly place God in the center, if you're going to truly honor God, if you're going to truly stand in awe of God, then what people should see in your response to getting tickets to be in the presence of God should be just as um, exuberant as people do when they find out that they just got Taylor Swift tickets. And I think that's what Psalm 50 is. It is an exuberance that too often you don't see when people are getting out of their cars in the parking lot on Sunday morning in their churches. Wow, what would it be like? I'd want to go to a church where people were as excited as David was. 